be a time where in your vehicles you would not be using petrol or diesel but a sustainable version of that fuel. But how will that happen? What are biofuels and what do we keep talking about when we talk about sustainable mobility? Transportation might just completely change for you and I, but we need to understand how that happens, why government is pushing so much for this buzzword that we use often, that is biofuels. We need to understand that and a lot more. So today joining us is Mr. Suhas Bakshi. He's the co-founder and CEO of Biofuel Circle. Uh, Mr. Bakshi, such a pleasure to speak with you. So and, nice meeting you. <laughs> you know, I was saying, uh, we are talking about future, something that would be absolutely different and sustainable mobility or how you would go around cities and towns would change as well. Can you briefly or just simply explain what biofuels are? How would that change the way we travel? Uh, so a technical definition of biofuels is they are derived from biomass. Okay, so what is biomass? Biomass is generally the organic waste that we leave behind when we produce food of any type or when plants grow. Uh, so khet kachra in Hindi is biomass or food waste from hotels or from our homes is biomass. Now, it's organic, it has carbon and hydrogen, and any type of fuel also has carbon and hydrogen. Uh, so lots of technology work has happened to figure out, can this biomass be converted into fuels which are modern day fuels? Now, what's the modern day fuel? When you and I fly, the aircraft is using uh, aviation turbine fuel. Can that be made out of biomass? When uh, you and I drive, we drive a car, it uses petrol or diesel. Can that be made out of biomass? Now that has been a question which has been a prominent question faced by technologists around the world and they have definitely found a solution to that. So I would say modern biofuels are those fuels which are made from biomass but for end use applications which are today's end use applications. Okay, so uh, you know you spoke about different types of biomass. Are we already using, is there any proven technology where this particular waste will be used as biofuels? Is that already happening? So once again, let's uh, draw a comparison between what are fossil fuels and what are the different applications of fossil fuels. Uh, what you and I don't realize is that the power which is lighting this room is most probably come from a power plant which is used some type of fuel. And in most likelihood in our country, that is a thermal power plant, uh, which has used coal uh, as a fuel. So you have solid fossil fuels. Uh, one of the most, uh, I would say, organized and mature uses of biomass is replacement of coal in power production or energy production. Uh, so if you are just able to imagine that uh, uh, there is agricultural residue available at the end of a harvest season in a, plant, uh, in a field. If you are able to gather that, if you are able to densify it, make it as similar to coal as possible in fuel properties, then it's a ready replacement. Now, this type of use has been prevalent in India for many years. Uh, rice husk, bagasse, uh, and several different types of agricultural residues have been used for power generation and steam production in, in industries for a long time. But given the fact that this is industrial end use, most people are not completely aware of it. And also this is a small portion of the overall energy mix. Uh, for day-to-day -day fuel uses, such, such as petrol, uh, we've been now using ethanol mixed in uh, uh, petrol for some period of time. World over, this has been one of the more prevalent uses of biofuels. Uh, so ethanol, which is made out of agricultural residue, uh, come in, coming in as a blending uh, alternative for petrols has been prevalent. India has a very ambitious target towards that. Uh, we've also been using in the recent past something called compressed biogas. Uh, this is being made once again out of agricultural residue uh, or any type of food residue. Uh, the gas generated is similar in properties to natural gas or compressed natural gas, which is CNG, which is used in our taxis. Uh, so these are these have been some of the prevalent uses, though I would say they're just scratching the surface. Uh, we have a long way to go, but uh, I think the journey seems to be quite clear to us now. 
uh, that's interesting because as i was pointing out earlier the government is pushing a lot for biofuels there are a lot of companies which are putting up biofuel plants or as you said compressed biogas as well i'll talk about the market opportunity here in greater detail towards uh, later part of this conversation what i wanted to understand is uh, what is the transportation or the lead period like when you get biomass from different sources to when it is converted into a biofuel is it difficult to obtain a raw material how is the supply in this particular uh, that's, that's actually the crux of uh, you know uh, uh, how to actually harness the potential uh, let let's start with the fact that you know one type of biomass uh, is agricultural waste now what is agricultural waste if i am a rice growing farmer at the end of the harvest season the rice grows i harvest the rice what stays in the field uh, is what is biomass now uh, uh, how do i now start accumulating that uh, one of the first difficulties in a country like india is absence of mechanization for collection of this uh, biomass uh, the second is uh, it grows only during the harvest season but if i let us say set up a plant to convert it into fuel uh, that plant will be an industrial enterprise and it will work, work for 12 months in a year uh, so i have seasonal supply and a everyday requirement so there is a need for not only harvesting uh, harnessing it but also storing it uh, which requires investment in storage infrastructure which also in requires investment in working capital uh so availability of storages and cost of working capital is the second strong constraints that constraint that we see right now the third and extremely important uh, consideration uh in the context of the consumer being an industrial consumer okay the biofuel producer is an industrial enterprise and the supplier is a rural enterprise who is unorganized uh, so let us say i i am a large industrial buyer i want to buy feed stock what do i do i set i you know send out an rfp i float a tender now the rural enterprises are not used to dealing with industrial enterprise and their purchase process so there is a disconnect here so i would say these three are uh, uh, you know as per my uh, standpoint three of the strong constraints that we see in india right now if we are able to surpass these constraints then potentially more than 200 million metric tons of biomass just as agricultural residue is available for harnessing in india that is 17% of india's energy need uh so this is huge it yeah this is huge so then how much of it are we able to use right now for industrial use out of this 2 million metric tons that you said which we could potentially use is the current usage way lower than that number it's uh, i would say at the most 20% of what is available and uh, uh, so so clearly there is a work to be done look uh, these the fossil fuel supply chain took 150 years to build so you've got a global supply chain of crude oil you've got a global supply chain for coal you got a global supply chain for everything but look it has taken a long time in making uh, this is an opportunity which is which is a big opportunity uh but to create a supply chain and which works in exactly similar structure as the fossil fuel supply chain uh, i think uh, we have an opportunity but we have to do what was done in last 150 years in probably a very short period of time but you know the advantage also is that we are an agricultural economy so we do have uh, raw material available here we don't have to depend on imports for anything for that matter we are self sufficient here so where does biofuel circle come into the picture what exactly are you doing here so look uh, when we looked at the constraints uh, we felt that uh, well technology has come to a point uh, especially information technology has come to a point where there are so many things which are possible with the use of information technology uh, let's look at something like uh, you know olx uh, i'm having uh, you know a used cupboard or a used sofa in my house and i put it on olx and somebody comes and has a look at it and you know before i know it it's gone now uh, can i create a similar possibility for somebody who's a farmer and who has waste right uh, can i use technology to make show him possibilities and to make sure that he is actually able to earn out of the waste what that he has that's the first point of intervention or the first point of arrival for biofuel circle the second is 
can I actually create uh, an entrepreneur out of somebody who is just having a tractor lying idle in the rural area? Uh, because after the harvest season, the use of tractors in rural area is uh, sporadic. So there, are, there is idle capacity available. So can I tap into these idle tractors and make somebody earn a higher level of livelihood out of transporting this biomass which is available in field to a point of storage? The third point is, can I create a storage? And we call it biomass bank. So we create a biomass bank like a blood bank. So you, so you go and deposit biomass there and you get paid for it. Okay. Uh, the fourth point of arrival is the equipment, which is mechanization equipment. So we rent out mechanization equipment. And the last bit is we have a B2B e-commerce platform, which connects all of this to industry. Uh, so, you know, you have on one digital platform, each one of these activities happening. You can look at it as an independent sphere in itself, but together it's an ecosystem uh, which allows industry to connect to rural in a very, very efficient manner. That's very interesting. So basically, you are the OLX or Zomato of uh, <laughs> connecting the farmers to the <clears throat> end users or the industry. Um, but do you see that there is some reluctance from farmers? You spoke about it as well. It's an unorganized sector. So how are they using, if it's an app, how are you reaching out to them that, yes, you can go ahead, go on the app and sell the biomass here? So, you know, this is the premise with which we started, that this will be tough. Uh, but to our surprise, we found that uh, the farmers were not reluctant because, look, uh, gone are the days when you look at a farmer as somebody who is relatively undereducated and unaware. You've got generation, I mean, most of these families have, uh, you know, two or three generations. Mm -hmm. The grandson or the son is on Facebook or is on WhatsApp. There is a smartphone at home. Uh, you know, uh, they're buying things on Flipkart. They're buying things on Amazon. Uh, so, you know, I think uh, uh, there is penetration of uh, mobile commerce there. And we did not find uh, them to be difficult set of people to actually onboard. Uh, so this was a myth which was actually broken when we, in just one and a half months time in the district of Mathura in UP, we were able to onboard seven and a half thousand farmers on the platform. And uh, each one of these farmers in the end got paid in their UPI account for the biomass that uh, uh, was made available by them. Oh, so talk about technology uh, enriching lives. How many touch points have you been able to, uh, you know, go through uh, because of this app? Of which areas or geographies are you catering to right now? So we are in Maharashtra. We started in Maharashtra. We are in Gujarat. Uh, we are in UP. Uh, we are in Punjab and Tamil Nadu. Uh, so five states. Uh, we currently cover more than 50 districts. Uh, we have uh, close to 20,000 farmers who have uh, been onboarded. Uh, we have more than 1,000 businesses who are on the platform. And uh, uh, on an annual basis, more than 200 crore worth of biomass transactions currently happen on the platform. Interesting. So uh, when we talk about biomass and paying farmers, do the rates change there? Is it also market driven? Because if you're going to the farmer saying this is how much we'll pay you for biomass, um, what makes them just lap it, lap onto that? Look, for them, it is actually a problem to be solved rather than an opportunity. If if I if my rice paddy field is uh, having biomass lying all over it, uh, I actually the trigger for people burning is they don't want to spend money taking it away. So that's the reason they burn it. Uh, now, how do I create an economic incentive? And look, the incentive need not be very big. It's about recognizing the fact that there is an alternative and that alternative is an inexpensive, in fact, paying alternative. Uh, so it's not about how much do I get, but it's about there is a ready mechanism for somebody to take care of my problem. And I get paid too because they look at it as feedstock available. Uh, the How much do they get paid is obviously driven by, you know, uh, you know a fall down of uh, what's the price at which the industry buys it. Uh, which is obviously linked to uh, the, uh, you know, comparison with what's the fuel value uh, and what's the comparable rate for fossil fuel. So it kind of flows down for, from there. But if I have to give you a number, uh, a two acre farmer on an average in India uh, who produces two seasons of, uh, uh, you know, agriculture in a year could earn up to 10,000 rupees additional income every year. 
which is 10% of his uh, current average income. Uh, so just from agricultural activity, by making biomass available, you can increase your agricultural income by 10%. So we can solve the issue of stubble burning if everyone goes ahead and gives their biomass. Cell, actually, it's the word is cell, it's just not giving away. But that doesn't happen too often. It doesn't happen because the constraints are bigger than just awareness. Uh, look, uh, the stubble burning happens not because the farmer is happy to burn it, but he seems to be in a situation where there is no alternative. Uh, the, uh, so let's look at two seasons. Uh, at the end of October, my harvest is ready and I need to take the crop out. And then what is remaining is loads and loads of kachra on my field. Uh, I need to take care of it and I need to remove it in a period of between 15 days to 45 days time. Right? Uh, now, this is where mechanization and absence of mechanization plays a role. What's the size of the fleet which is covering it? Right? So there needs to be investment in that infrastructure. There needs to be space available to locally store it and densify it in the rural areas. So this is, uh, this is a matter of actually setting up that infrastructure. And as we start setting up the infrastructure, I'm sure uh, we will move away from this problem. But this is not going to be like switch off and switch on kind of a mechanism that now people are aware and now they'll stop burning it. I think we also need to create the infrastructure. Once we have the infrastructure, so the districts in which we have operated, we have seen zero instances of stubble burning uh, and uh, I'm sure this can be and, and obviously our plan is to make sure that we take it forward. That's very interesting and nice to know. Uh, so in that case we'll need more government intervention when it comes to policy around mechanization or infrastructure development. Is there a policy in place for that? There is a strong push on policy. So for example, now with these different end uses, let's say compressed biogas as an end use or second generation ethanol as an end use or drop in biodiesel as an end use. So for each one of these enterprises, investment in aggregation machinery is now seen as a subject of subsidy. So the government subsidizes uh, purchase of these equipment uh, the government also subs uh, you know, encourages farmer producer companies. Now, farmer producer companies uh, are uh, entities which are coming into picture as farmer collectives. And so if there are farmer collectives in the rural areas in, and if, if the farmer collective wants to invest in these equipment, once again, they get a subsidy. Uh, so there are, I think, several different models of uh, uh, you know, enterprise creation which are possible. Uh, there is a strong push towards uh, uh, investment in this infrastructure. Uh, there is also, in several cases, a combination of reward and penalty which uh, local administrations uh, offer uh, for making sure that stubble burning does not happen. But the way I see it is, like we created enterprises which are based on grain, uh, we need to create enterprises which are based on waste. And uh, this is uh, a parallel ecosystem which needs to get considered. Initially, when I started talking to uh, people about this, uh, two instances which I would want to highlight. One is uh, uh, with respect to financing. Uh, I said, look, if I am a nuts and bolts producer for Toyota, I set up a small manufacturing shed somewhere in Bangalore in the vicinity of their plant. I walk into a bank and I say that I want working capital. Uh, on the strength of a Toyota order, I have no problem. I get I get working capital, but if I say I am a biomass, uh, you know, storage company whose biomass is going to an Indian oil refinery somewhere, uh, ninety percent of the cases the banks are not going to entertain me. They are going to find ways and means to dissuade me. So how do you create a mechanism where these businesses are accepted as businesses which are? Uh, you know, which are which are uh, actual supply chain businesses, uh, you know, which are industrial businesses and not some small rural outpost. Uh, this is one thing which we need to make clear and policy direction needs to go in that. Uh, I think the uh, second and extremely important thing is to make sure that we encourage, uh, you know, uh, local village level enterprises uh, to form these businesses because uh, unlike in case of several other feedstocks, biomass is going to be a winner only if you create small rural enterprises. And I'll tell you why. Uh, if you take a three metric ton truck and try and put rural agricultural residue in that, 
a three metric ton capacity trailer will be able to take 500 kg of biomass because it is fluffy, it is light. Uh, now, uh, if I transport this for 15 kilometer distance using diesel, which is leaving carbon footprint, uh, then within 15 kilometers, all the economic and in, uh, environmental incentive is over. Okay, uh, so there is no case for transporting this fluffy biomass. So I need to create densified bales on the farm. Uh, for that, I need a, a small rural businessman. Uh, so clearly, this is an opportunity to make sure that not only do you implement technology, but you implement it through, uh, you know, uh, businesses which are very small micro enterprises based in rural areas. And if you encourage them, uh, then this is this revolution is very much possible. And that's the crux of it. We need to go to the hinterlands and ensure that there are smaller establishments which are taking care of it but since they do not think of it as a profitable uh, venture as of now maybe it's taking some time um, so when you spoke about the market size opportunity that we have here how big would biofuels be uh, once say five to six years down the line when what government is planning right now actually sees light of day any estimates that the market has put So look, out? I think uh, the moment you come to estimates, uh, it's it's something which is everybody's estimate is going to be different. But if one has to look at what is the least common, uh, you know, uh, baseline that people draw, uh, I would say combination of agricultural residue, biofuels, and very interestingly, something called biofertilizers. Uh, see, when you bi take biomass and convert it to fuel, only 15% of it gets converted to fuel. See, chemis chemically, what you're taking is mixture of carbon, hydrogen, and several other elements which have come from the soil, right? So uh, what you take out is uh, as fuel from biomass is only 10 to 15% of biomass by its weight. The balance which remains is the sludge. That sludge is actually rich biofertilizer. Uh, if you're able to take it back to the, uh, you know, to, to the same farm, uh, you are going to have a big play in the soil nutrition business too. So if you combine these three, my take on this is a $50 billion market by 2030. That's a huge opportunity. That's no wonder the government is also tapping on it. And of course, it promotes circular economy. That's the basic idea of going for biofuels. Are they as effective when it comes to their utilization versus a fossil fuel, say petrol and diesel, in terms of mileage, how many kilometers can one travel if they use a biofuel vis-a-vis -vis a pure petrol, not with any blending? Is there any maths that is done on that? So I'll give you an example of compressed biogas. Compressed biogas is uh, same fuel value as compressed natural gas. Uh, it has uh, uh, same fundamental efficiency which, would, which you would get out of the fuel. Uh, so uh, Technology will allow you to create a fuel derivative which is same as the fossil fuel. There is absolutely no difference. Uh, drop in uh, fuels, and you know there are a lot of small units which produce uh, uh, through a process called thermal cracking, drop in biodiesel, and uh, uh, this is same as diesel. Uh, so uh, I do not believe that uh, the end use applications are going to be inefficient. Yeah, that that is one worry that people have. Maybe that efficiency would be lower. And would they have to pay any higher amount for this? I wouldn't say because petrol and diesel are already quite expensive. <laughs> so I wouldn't want to say any more costly than that. But is that a fear as well? So I do not know how will the pricing mechanism emerge over a period of time. Right now, almost everybody pegs it to what is the current price of the equivalent fossil fuel. And that's the price at which you make it available. Uh, the uh, But I'm sure over a period of time, your prices would be driven by what is the cost structure of producing it would be. Uh, so I would say we may not have to go to benchmarks, which are these global benchmarks for uh, what should the price be. We may actually be able to come up with our own price structure based on what's the cost of making it available. Yeah, and that is something that will take some time. So we need to figure it out com considering the market at that time. You said that globally biofuels are a big thing already. Um, can you give us some examples? Brazil for once has seen the highest ethanol blending that any country has seen. Uh, where do we stand vis-a-vis -vis global markets in terms of usage of biofuels? 
I just want to understand a comparison, maybe qualitatively also, but where do we stand? I think India is definitely one of the seen as one of the leaders in the biofuel world. Mm. Uh, Brazil uh, has been a pioneer in yeah. several different ways. Uh, US has uh, uh, always been a strong player as far as ethanol is concerned. Uh, India has not is not behind mm. both from a point of view of uh, where does the government put the policy uh, you know in place? Uh, where does the technology stand? What is the industry readiness to actually implement that technology? Uh, I think on all these fronts, India is definitely one of the leaders uh, as far as uh, bioenergy is concerned. And uh, I would say this is uh, definitely an opportunity for India uh, to, uh, uh, to be in a position to proclaim a strong global leadership uh, in an industry segment. So is this why we had Global Biofuel Alliance during G20? How is that changing? changing the way we are looking at this industry, are there many countries a member of this alliance? Uh, so the Global Biofuel Alliance is definitely a result of the fact that, uh, so G20 happened in India, uh, bioenergy was one of the streams uh, for global discussions. Uh, and uh, given the fact that uh, India finds itself on that pedestal where it is one of the global leaders, I think, uh, you know, uh, the initiative was taken and uh, the stage was right. Uh, I do believe the collaboration will lead to, number one, uh, strong technology alliances between uh, member countries. I mean, uh, look, if some work has happened uh, at a faster pace uh, on CBG in India, vis-a-vis -vis some work has happened on second generation or third generation ethanol somewhere else, I think these alliances will, uh, you know, uh, you, you will find a lot of these alliances actually happening based on uh, uh, the fact that uh, Global Biofuel Alliance has been created. Uh, I would expect this to actually drive uh, creation of a framework for uh, carbon neutrality. Uh, because uh, biomass driven carbon neutrality has not been a subject which uh, has ever been addressed at uh, the global level at such a scale. Uh, so there is an opportunity that this alliance has to actually create uh, maybe a more meaningful uh, structure for uh, carbon credits using biomass as a base. So, you know, uh, while you were saying that, a couple of questions popped up in my head. One of it is, when we say we'll use biofuels, will we use it in entirety or will we be blending it with fossil fuels? The start will always be through blending uh, for a reason which is linked to the fact that most of the applications that you're talking about are uh, applications which are reliably working right now. So, for example, if you take a power plant, mm. uh, uh, is it possible to use 100% biomass to produce power? Answer is yes. Mm. Okay, uh, but are there systems ready right now to start using it? Uh, is the reliability in that particular power plant proven for 100% shift? Uh, so the start will be with 5% blending. It will move to 20% blending. Uh, over a period of time, as they are doing investment into new infrastructure, their investment then will be for biomass-driven infrastructure. So you will go to a larger usage of biomass. So it's not about whether it is technically possible, but it's about what is the transition process. And the transition process will have to be a stage transition process because you don't want to disturb the end, you know, the, the, the users of it. Uh, you know, so it's a, it's a little bit like uh, the fertilizer scenario. Are organic fertilizers great? Yes. But do you should you suddenly stop using what you currently do? The answer is no. So there has to be an approach which is a transition approach. We saw that with Sri Lanka. So we don't want to take make that mistake. But when you say it has to be stage by stage, but there could be one day when all our vehicles are run purely on biofuels. There could be a possibility that that will happen. So uh, if I have to answer that, I would say I would look for, look for a day when all the rural energy is bioenergy driven. Mm. Uh, so are tractors running on compressed biogas or biodiesel? Uh, are the local pumps uh, running using those uh, uh, you know, fuels? Uh, are, are you producing power in rural areas using uh, biomass as basic fuel? Uh, but transporting this fuel for 10,000 kilometer distance uh, it may never be a, so if we are able to, if you can think of a world where uh, uh, you create a lot of these distributed centers of complete circular economy, mm. okay, and uh, 
they are fueled by biofuels okay uh, then that type of world at least in my dreams is definitely possible let's uh, let's hope that happens and that happens quickly uh, you know while we are talking about uh, ethanol blending recently what happened with sugar mills is they were asked to direct the molasses to sugar output versus ethanol do you think that is something which would hurt the uh, targets that we have in terms of 20% blending or do you think government intervention sometimes could hurt the sector in some way is is this a is this something which could impact the targets is generally what i want so to it ask. does have a short term impact because uh, uh, you know uh, people especially the sugar sh- sector made lots of investment in producing ethanol uh, you know in uh, so from that point of view there was a setback to that mm-hmm. and uh, hence i would say that uh, uh, a policy turn like that definitely uh, has a negative impact mm-hmm. uh you also start thinking about will a similar thing happen in other sectors uh so from that point of view obviously uh such a turn is uh, not a nice thing to happen uh does it very strongly impact the larger long term direction and i would say this could be a blip in the long term direction rather than something which sets a precedent because let us say producing ethanol using starchy biomass as opposed to using sugary biomass uh, technology is available investments could be made uh, stronger r&d could be done in making sure that uh, your uh, you know use of sugar as primary ingredient for producing ethanol over a period of time becomes one of the things and not the only thing Uh, so uh, but it's long term and it's not short term so in the short term uh, this policy definitely gives a negative vibe has a negative impact uh, but i still believe that in the long term there are several different ways in which uh, there the target could be made and let's hope that happens you briefly also mentioned about 1g ethanol 2g ethanol for the benefit can you explain what the difference between the two is and we are using 2g ethanol right now is it correct so the first generation ethanol is almost always using uh, you know molasses to uh, create ethanol uh, as uh, or molasses or for that matter any form of uh, you know sugar uh, or sugar product as uh, uh, ingredient to make ethanol that is first generation second generation is you start using starch as a base uh so starch as a base would mean uh that uh, uh the biomass which is available as uh, uh you know uh, the the waste in the field could potentially become uh the usable biomass for making ethanol this is the plant this is the technology in which iocl has invested in panipat to create a second generation ethanol plant uh it's relatively new from a technology point of view and hence uh, the investments are big uh so more and more such plants coming up and most of the oil companies are setting up these plants uh so you would find biomass driving production of ethanol over a period of time uh even here uh, there could be uh, there could be several different ways to look at how to drive the feed stock availability and creating ethanol uh so i would say uh, as we move towards second generation future in ethanol uh you would probably see Uh, different type of ethanol manufacturers as opposed to what you see now so which are the big players right now who are investing in the space you said some of these oil marketing companies ioc putting up the panipat plant are there any other companies which are taking big strides in the biofuel space uh so there are you know private sector and public sector companies which are making uh, taking big strides uh the companies which are uh, making big investments in the biogas space includes the reliance group includes adanis uh, there is a german multinational called verbio uh, so these are uh, some of the stronger names in addition to the psus like, like indian oil hpcl and bpcl uh, so these are the companies who are making very large investments you do find uh, you know uh, sugar sector becoming uh, uh quite alert to the fact that this is a horizontal diversification possibility for them uh you do find a lot of power sector epc companies uh looking at this as uh, uh you know an area to be present in and uh, uh, last but not the least you also find companies getting into things like biochar biochar is an interesting alternative uh, so can i get biomass and not convert it to fuel but get con- converted to activated carbon uh so that's also a possibility so look technology shows various different pathways and you see companies making investments uh, 
yeah, in some in some places small, but in some cases very big and ambitious. That's so good to know. And in the last couple of climate clock conversations that I've had, the core point has been how you can use that technology for distribution. So you have the product ready, but you need to distribute it well. As you said, we need to go across to villages and ensure that they look at it as an entrepreneurship opportunity rather than thinking that it'll take so much investment. But thank you, Mr. Bakshi. It was such an enriching conversation. We learned so much about such a technical conversation generally that people would say that what are biofuels? How would it impact everyone? And as you said, some big companies are making some big investments and they have ideas here as well. So such a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. It has been a pleasure talking to you too. Thank you so much. Okay, all right. With that, we'll uh, wrap on this conversation. But you keep writing to us. We've been getting a lot of queries, a lot of comments. So let us know what you want us to talk about. And we'll do that on this podcast again. But thank you so much for being such an amazing audience today. Thanks a lot. Thank you.